We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audio book presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audio book with friends and loved ones. This is for educational purposes only. Chapter 8. The Journey Back. You are hampered in your progress by your demand to know what you do not know. This is actually a way of holding on to deprivation. You cannot reasonably object to following instructions in a course for knowing on the grounds that you do not know. The need for the course is implicit in your objection. Knowledge is not the motivation for learning this course. Pieces. As the prerequisite for knowledge, peace must be learned. This is only because those who are in conflict are not peaceful, and peace is the condition of knowledge, because it is the condition of the kingdom. Knowledge will be restored when you meet its conditions. This is not a bargain made by God, who makes no bargains. It is merely the result of your misuse of his laws on behalf of a will that is not his. Knowledge is his will. If you are opposing his will, how can you have knowledge? I have told you what knowledge offers you, but it is clear that you do not regard this as wholly desirable. If you did, you would hardly be willing to throw it away so readily, when the ego asks for your allegiance. The distraction of the ego seems to interfere with your learning, but the ego has no power to distract you, unless you give it the power. The ego's voice is a hallucination. You cannot expect it to say I am not real. Hallucinations are inaccurate perceptions of reality. Yet you are not asked to dispel them alone. You are merely asked to evaluate them in terms of their results to you. If you do not want them on the basis of loss of peace, they will be removed from your mind for you. Every response to the ego is a call to war, and war does deprive you of peace. Yet in this war there is no opponent. This is the reinterpretation of reality which you must make to secure peace, and the only one you need ever make. The Direction of the Curriculum Those whom you perceive as opponents are part of your peace, which you are giving up by attacking them. How can you have what you give up? You share to have, but you do not give it up yourself. When you give up peace, you are excluding yourself from it. This is a condition which is so alien to the kingdom that you cannot understand the state which prevails within it. Your past learning must have taught you the wrong things, simply because it has not made you happy. On this basis alone, its value should be questioned. If learning aims at change, and that is always its purpose, are you satisfied with the changes your learning has brought you? Dissatisfaction with learning outcomes must be a sign of learning failure, since it means that you did not get what you want. The curriculum of the atonement is the opposite of the curriculum you have established for yourselves, but so is its outcome. If the outcome of yours has made you unhappy, and if you want a different one, a change in the curriculum is obviously necessary. The first change that must be introduced is a change in direction. A meaningful curriculum cannot be inconsistent. If it is planned by two teachers, each believing in diametrically opposed ideas, it cannot be integrated. If it is carried out by these two teachers simultaneously, each one merely interferes with the other. This leads to fluctuation, but not to change. The volatile have no direction. They cannot choose one because they cannot relinquish the other even if the other does not exist. Their conflicted curriculum teaches them all directions exist, and gives them no rationale for choice. The total senselessness of such a curriculum must be fully recognized before a real change in direction becomes possible. You cannot learn simultaneously from two teachers who are in total disagreement about everything. Their joint curriculum presents an impossible learning task. They are teaching you entirely different things in entirely different ways, which might be possible, except for the crucial fact that both are teaching you about yourself. Your reality is unaffected by both, but if you listen to both, your mind will be split about what your reality is. The Rationale for Choice There is a rationale for choice. Only one teacher knows what your reality is. If learning that is the purpose of the curriculum, you must learn it of him. 
the ego does not know what it is trying to teach. It is trying to teach you what you are without knowing it. The ego is expert only in confusion. It does not understand anything else. As a teacher, then, it is totally confused and totally confusing. Even if you could disregard the Holy Spirit entirely, which is quite impossible, you could learn nothing from the ego because the ego knows nothing. Is there any possible reason for choosing a teacher such as this? Does the total disregard of anything it teaches make anything but sense? Is this the teacher to whom a son of God should turn to find himself? The ego has never given you a sensible answer to anything. Simply on the grounds of your own experience with the ego's teaching, should not this alone disqualify it as your future teacher? Yet the ego has done more harm to your learning than this alone. Learning is joyful if it leads you along your natural path, and facilitates the development of what you have. When you are taught against your nature, however, you will lose by your learning because your learning will imprison you. Your will is in your nature, and therefore cannot go against it. The ego cannot teach you anything as long as your will is free because you will not listen to it. It is not your will to be imprisoned because your will is free. That is why the ego is the denial of free will. It is never God who coerces you because he shares his will with you. His voice teaches only his will, but that is not the Holy Spirit's lesson because that is what you are. The lesson is that your will and God's cannot be out of accord because they are one. This is the undoing of everything the ego tries to teach. It is not, then, only the direction of the curriculum which must be unconflicted, but also the content. The ego wants to teach you that you want to oppose God's will. This unnatural lesson cannot be learned, but the attempt to learn it is a violation of your own freedom, and makes you afraid of your will because it is free. The Holy Spirit opposes any imprisoning of the will of a son of God, knowing that the will of the Son is the Father's. The Holy Spirit leads you steadily along the path of freedom, teaching you how to disregard, or look beyond, everything that would hold you back. We said before that the Holy Spirit teaches you the difference between pain and joy. That is the same as saying that he teaches you the difference between imprisonment and freedom. You cannot make this distinction without him. That is because you have taught yourself that imprisonment is freedom. Believing them to be the same, how can you tell them apart? Can you ask the part of your mind that taught you to believe they are the same to teach you the difference between them? The Holy Spirit's teaching takes only one direction and his only one goal. His direction is freedom and his goal is God. Yet he cannot conceive of God without you because it is not God's will to be without you. When you have learned that your will is God's, you could no more will to be without him than he could will to be without you. This is freedom and this is joy. Deny yourself this and you are denying God his kingdom because he created you for this. When we said, all power and glory are yours because the kingdom is his, this is what we meant, the will of God is without limit, and all power and glory lie within it. It is boundless in strength and in love and in peace. It has no boundaries because its extension is unlimited, and it encompasses all things because it created all things. By creating all things it made them part of itself. You are the will of God because this is how you were created. Because your creator creates only like himself, you are like him. You are part of him who is all power and glory, and are therefore as unlimited as he is. To what else except all power and glory can the Holy Spirit appeal to restore God's kingdom? His appeal, then, is merely to what the kingdom is, and for its own acknowledgement of what it is. When you acknowledge this, you bring the acknowledgement automatically to everyone because you have acknowledged everyone. By your recognition you awaken theirs, and through theirs yours is extended. Awakening runs easily and gladly through the kingdom in answer to the call of God. This is the natural response of every son of God to the voice of his creator, because it is the voice for his creations and for his own extension. The Holy Encounter. Glory be to God in the highest, and to you because he has so willed it. Ask and it shall be given you because it has already been given.
ask for light and learn that you are light. If you want understanding and enlightenment you will learn it, because your will learn to it is your decision to listen to the teacher who knows of light, and can therefore teach it to you. There is no limit on your learning because there is no limit on your minds. There is no limit on his will to teach because he was created to teach. Knowing his function perfectly he wills to fulfill it perfectly, because that is his joy and yours. To fulfill the will of God perfectly is the only joy and peace that can be fully known because it is the only function that can be fully experienced. When this is accomplished, then, there is no other experience. Yet the wish for other experience will block its accomplishment because God's will cannot be forced upon you, being an experience of total willingness. The Holy Spirit knows how to teach this, but you do not. That is why you need him and why God gave him to you. Only his teaching will release your will to God's, uniting it with his power and glory, and establishing them as yours. You share them as God shares them because this is the natural outcome of their being. The will of Father and of the Son are one together by their extension. Their extension is the result of their oneness, holding their unity together by extending their joint will. This is perfect creation by the perfectly created in union with perfect creator. The Father must give fatherhood to his Son because his own fatherhood must be extended outward. You who belong in God have the holy function of extending his fatherhood by placing no limits upon it. Let the Holy Spirit teach you how to do this, for you will know what it means of God himself. When you meet anyone, remember it is a holy encounter. As you see him you will see yourself. As you treat him you will treat yourself. As you think of him you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself a lose sight of yourself. Whenever two sons of God meet, they are given another chance at salvation. Do not leave anyone without giving salvation to him and receiving it yourself. For I am always there with you, in remembrance of you. The goal of the curriculum, regardless of the teacher you choose, is know thyself. There is nothing else to learn. Everyone is looking for himself, and for the power and glory he thinks he has lost. Whenever you are with anyone, you have another opportunity to find them. Your power and glory are in him because they are yours. The ego tries to find them in yourself because it does not know where to look. The Holy Spirit teaches you that, if you look only at yourself, you cannot find yourself because that is not what you are. Whenever you are with a brother, you are learning what you are because you are teaching what you are. He will respond either with pain or with joy depending on which teacher you are following. He will be imprisoned or released according to your decision, and so will you. Never forget your responsibility to him because it is your responsibility to yourself. Give him his place in the kingdom, and you will have yours. The kingdom cannot be found alone, and you who are the kingdom cannot find yourselves alone. To achieve the goal of the curriculum, then, you cannot listen to the ego. Its purpose is to defeat its own ego. The ego does not know this because it does not know anything. But you can know this, and you will know it if you are willing to look at what the ego has made of you. This is your responsibility because, once you have really done this, you will accept the atonement for yourself. What other choice could you make? Having made this choice, you will begin to learn and understand why you have believed that. When you met someone else, you had thought that he was someone else. And every holy encounter in which you enter fully will teach you this is not so. You can encounter only part of yourself because you are part of God, who is everything. His power and glory are everywhere, and you cannot be excluded from them. The ego teaches that your strength is in you alone. The Holy Spirit teaches that all strength is in God and therefore in you. God wills no one suffer. He does not will anyone to suffer for a wrong decision, including you. That is why he has given you the means for undoing it. Through his power and glory all your wrong decisions are undone completely releasing you and your brothers from every imprisoning thought any part of the sonship has accepted. Wrong decisions have no power because they are not true. The imprisonment which they seem to produce is no more true than they are. 
power and glory belong to God alone. So do you. God gives whatever belongs to him because he gives of himself, and everything belongs to him. Giving of yourself is the function he gave you. Fulfilling it perfectly will teach you what you have of him, and this will teach you what you are in him. You cannot be powerless to do this because this is your power. Glory is God's gift to you because that is what he is. See this glory everywhere to learn what you are. The Light of the World If God's will for you is complete peace and joy, unless you experience only this you must be refusing to acknowledge his will. His will does not vacillate, being changeless forever. When you are not at peace, it can only be because you do not believe you are in him. Yet he is all in all. His peace is complete, and you must be included in it. His laws govern you because they govern everything. You cannot exempt yourself from his laws, although you can disobey them. Yet if you do, and only if you do, you will feel lonely and helpless because you are denying yourself everything I am come as a light into a world that does deny itself everything. It does this simply by dissociating itself from everything. It is therefore an illusion of isolation, maintained by fear of the same loneliness which is its illusion. I have told you that I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That is why I am the light of the world. If I am with you in the loneliness of the world, the loneliness is gone. You cannot maintain the illusion of loneliness if you are not alone. My purpose, then, is to overcome the world. I do not attack it, but my light must dispel it because of what it is. Light does not attack darkness but it does shine it away. If my light goes with you everywhere, you shine it away with me. The light becomes ours, and you cannot abide in darkness any more than darkness can abide wherever you go. The remembrance of me is the remembrance of yourself and of him who sent me to you. You were in darkness until God's will was done completely by any part of the sonship. When this was done, it was perfectly accomplished by all. How else could it be perfectly accomplished? My mission was simply to unite the will of the Sonship with the will of the Father by being aware of the Father's will myself. This is the awareness I came to give you, and your problem in accepting it is the problem of this world. Dispelling it is salvation, and in this sense I am the salvation of the world. The world must despise and reject me because the world is the belief that love is impossible. Your reactions to me are the reactions of the world to God. If you will accept the fact that I am with you, you are denying the world and accepting God. My will is his, and your will to hear me is the decision to hear his voice and abide in his will. As God sent me to you, so will I send you to others. And I will go to them with you, so we can teach them peace and union. Do you not think the world needs peace as much as you do? Do you not want to give it to the world as much as you want to receive it? For unless you do, you will not receive it. If you will to have it of me, you must give it. Rehabilitation does not come from anyone else. You can have guidance from without, but you must accept it from within. The guidance must be what you want, or it will be meaningless to you. That is why rehabilitation is a collaborative venture. I can tell you what to do, but this will not help you unless you collaborate by believing that I know what to do. Only then will your mind choose to follow me. Without your will you cannot be rehabilitated. Motivation to be healed is the crucial factor in rehabilitation. Without this, you are deciding against healing, and your veto of my will for you makes healing impossible. If healing is our joy twill, unless our wills are joined you cannot be healed. This is obvious when you consider what healing is for. Healing is the way in which the separation is overcome. Separation is overcome by union. It cannot be overcome by separating. The will to unite must be unequivocal, or the will itself is divided or not whole. Your will is the means by which you determine your own condition because will is the mechanism of decision. It is the power by which you separate or join, and experience pain or joy accordingly. My will cannot overcome yours, because yours is as powerful as mine. 
If it were not so, the sons of God would be unequal. All things are possible through our joint will, but my will alone cannot help you. Your will is as free as mine, and God himself would not go against it. I cannot will what God does not twill. I can offer you my will to make yours invincible by this sharing, but I cannot oppose yours without competing with it, and thereby violating God's will for you. Nothing God created can oppose your will, as nothing God created can oppose his. God gave your will its power, which I can only acknowledge in honor of his. If you want to be like me I will help you, knowing that we are alike. If you want to be different, I will wait until you change your mind. I can teach you, but only you can choose to listen to my teaching. How else can it be, if God's kingdom is freedom? Freedom cannot be learned by tyranny of any kind, and the perfect equality of all God's sons cannot be recognized through the dominion of one will over another. God's sons are equal in will, all being the will of their father. This is the only lesson I came to teach, knowing that it is true. When your will is not mine, it is not our father's. This means that you have imprisoned yours, and have not let it be free. Of yourselves you can do nothing, because of yourselves you are nothing. I am nothing without the father, and you are nothing without me because, by denying the father, you deny yourself. I will always remember you, and in my remembrance of you lies your remembrance of yourself. In our remembrance of each other lies our remembrance of God. And in this remembrance lies your freedom because your freedom is in him. Join, then, with me in praise of him and you whom he created. This is our gift of gratitude to him, which he will share with all his creations, to whom he gives equally whatever is acceptable to him because it is acceptable to him it is the gift of freedom, which is his will for all his sons. By offering freedom you will be free. Freedom is the only gift you can offer to God's sons, being an acknowledgement of what they are and what he is. Freedom is creation because it is love. What you seek to imprison you do not love. Therefore, when you seek to imprison anyone, including yourself, you do not love him and you cannot identify with him. When you imprison yourself, you are losing sight of your true identification with me and with the Father. Your identification is with the Father and with the Son. It cannot be with one and not the other. If you are part of one, you must be part of the other because they are one. The Holy Trinity is holy because it is one. If you exclude yourself from this union, you are perceiving the Holy Trinity as separated. You must be included in it, because it is everything. Unless you take your place in it and fulfill your function as part of it, it is as bereft as you are. No part of it can be imprisoned if its truth is to be known. Can you be separated from your identification and be at peace? Dissociation is not a solution, it is a delusion. The delusion will believe that truth will assail them, and so they do not see it because they prefer the delusion. Judging truth as something they do not want, they perceive deception and block knowledge. Help them by offering them your unified will on their behalf, as I am offering you mine on yours. Alone we can do nothing, but together, our wills fuse into something whose power is far beyond the power of its separate parts. By not being separate, the will of God is established in ours and as ours. This will is invincible because it is undivided. The undivided will of the sonship is the perfect creator, being wholly in the likeness of God, whose will it is. You cannot be exempt from it, if you are to understand what it is and what you are. By separating your will from mine, you are exempting yourself from the will of God which is yourself. Yet to heal is still to make whole. Therefore, to heal is to unite with those who are like you because perceiving this likeness is to recognize the Father. If your perfection is in him and only in him, how can you know it without recognizing him? The recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. There is no separation of God and his creation. You will learn this as you learn that there is no separation of your will and mine. Let the love of God shine upon you by your acceptance of me. My reality is yours and his.
By joining your will with mine you are signifying your awareness that the will of God is one. God's oneness and ours are not separate because his oneness encompasses ours. To join with me is to restore his power to you because we are sharing it. I offer you only the recognition of his power in you, but in that lies all truth. As we unite, we unite with him. Glory be to the union of God and his holy sons. All glory lies in them because they are united. The miracles we do bear witness to the will of the Father for his Son, and to our joy in uniting with his will for us. When you unite with me, you are uniting without the ego because I have renounced the ego in myself, and therefore cannot unite with yours. Our union is therefore the way to renounce the ego in yourself. The truth in both of us is beyond the ego. By willing that, you have gone beyond it toward truth. Our success in transcending the ego is guaranteed by God, and I can share this confidence for both of us and all of us. I bring God's peace back to all his children because I received it of him for us all. Nothing can prevail against our united wills because nothing can prevail against God's. Would you know the will of God for you? Ask it of me who knows it for you, and you will find it. I will deny you nothing, as God denies me nothing. Ours is simply the journey back to God, who is our home. Whenever fear intrudes anywhere along the road to peace, it is always because the ego has attempted to join the journey with us, and cannot do so. Sensing defeat and angered by it, the ego regards itself as rejected and becomes retaliative. You are invulnerable to its retaliation because I am with you. On this journey you have chosen me as your companion instead of the ego. Do not try to hold on to both, or you will try to go in different directions, and will lose the way. The ego's way is not mine, but it is also not yours. The Holy Spirit has one direction for all minds, and the one he taught me is yours. Let us not lose sight of his direction through illusions, for only illusions of another direction can obscure the one for which God's voice speaks in all of us. Never accord the ego the power to interfere with the journey because it has none, since the journey is the way to what is true. Leave all deception behind, and reach beyond all attempts of the ego to hold you back. I go before you because I am beyond the ego. Reach, therefore, for my hand because you want to transcend the ego. My will will never be wanting, and if you want to share it, you will. I give it willingly and gladly because I need you as much as you need me. The Power of Joint Decision We are the joint wool of the sonship, whose wholeness is for all. We begin the journey back by setting out together, and gather in our brothers as we continue together. Every gain in our strength is offered for all, so they, too, can lay aside their weakness and add their strength to us. God's welcome waits for us all, and he will welcome us as I am welcoming you. Forget not the kingdom of God for anything the world has to offer. The world can add nothing to the power and the glory of God and his holy sons, but it can blind the sons to the Father if they behold it. You cannot behold the world and know God. Only one is true. I am come to tell you that the choice of which is true is not yours. If it were, you would have destroyed yourselves. Yet God did not will the destruction of his creations, having created them for eternity. His will has saved you, not from yourselves but from your illusions of yourselves. He has saved you for yourselves. Let us glorify him whom the world denies, for over his kingdom it has no power. No one created by God can find joy in anything except the Eternal. That is not because he is deprived of anything else, but because nothing else is worthy of him. What God and his sons create is eternal, and in this and this only is their joy. Listen to the story of the prodigal son, and learn what God's treasure is in yours. This son of a loving father left his home and thought he squandered everything for nothing of any value although he did not know its worthlessness at the time. He was ashamed to return to his father, because he thought he had hurt him. Yet when he came home, the father welcomed him with joy because only the son himself was his father's treasure. 
he wanted nothing else. God wants only his son because his son is his only treasure. You want your creations as he wants his. Your creations are your gift to the Holy Trinity, created in gratitude for your creation. They do not leave you any more than you have left your creator, but they extend your creation as God extended himself to you. Can the creations of God himself take joy in what is not real? And what is real except the creations of God and those which are created like his? Your creations love you as your soul loves your father for the gift of creation. There is no other gift which is eternal, and therefore there is no other gift which is true. How, then, can you accept anything else or give anything else, and expect joy in return? And what else but joy would you want? You made neither yourself nor your function. You made only the decision to be unworthy of both. Yet you could not make yourself unworthy, because you are the treasure of God. What he values is valuable. There can be no question of its worth because its value lies in God's sharing himself with it and establishing its value forever. Your function is to add to God's treasure by creating yours. His will to you is his will for you. He would not withhold creation from you because his joy is in it. You cannot find joy except as God does. His joy lay in creating you, and he extends his fatherhood to you so that you can extend yourself as he did. You do not understand this because you do not understand him. No one who does not know his function can understand it, and no one can know his function unless he knows who he is. Creation is the will of God. His will created you to create. Your will was not created separate from his, and so it wills as he wills. An unwilling will does not mean anything, being a contradiction in terms which actually leaves nothing. When you think you are unwilling to will with God, you are not thinking. God's will is thought. It cannot be contradicted by thought. God does not contradict himself, and his sons, who are like him, cannot contradict themselves or him. Yet their thought is so powerful that they can even imprison the minds of God's sons, if they so choose. This choice does make the sons function unknown to him, but never to his creator and because it is not unknown to his creator, it is forever knowable to him. There is no question but one you should ever ask of yourself, do I want to know my father's will for me? He will not hide it. He has revealed it to me because I asked it of him, and learned of what he had already given. Our function is to function together because, apart from each other, we cannot function at all. The whole power of God's Son lies in all of us but not in any of us alone. God would not have us be alone because he does not will to be alone. That is why he created his son, and gave him the power to create with him. Our creations are as holy as we are, and we are the sons of God himself, and therefore as holy as he is. Through our creations we extend our love, and thus increase the joy of the Holy Trinity. You do not understand this for a very simple reason. You who are God's own treasure do not regard yourselves as valuable. Given this belief, you cannot understand anything. I share with God the knowledge of the value he puts upon you. My devotion to you is of him, being born of my knowledge of myself and him. We cannot be separated. Whom God has joined cannot be separated, and God has joined all his sons with himself. Can you be separated from your life and your being? The journey to God is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always, and what you are forever. It is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. Truth can only be experienced. It cannot be described, and it cannot be explained. I can make you aware of the conditions of truth, but the experience is of God. Together we can meet its conditions, but truth will dawn upon you of itself. What God has willed for you is yours. He has given his will to his treasure, whose treasure it is. Your heart lies where your treasure is, as his does. You who are beloved of God are wholly blessed. Learn this of me, and free the holy will of all those who are as blessed as you are. Communication and the Egobody Equation Attack is always physical. When attack in any form enters your mind, you are equating yourself with a body. 
This is the ego's interpretation of the body. You do not have to attack physically to accept this interpretation. You are accepting it simply by the belief that attack can get you something you want. If you did not believe this, the idea of attack would have no appeal for you. When you equate yourself with a body you will always experience depression. When a child of God thinks of himself in this way he is belittling himself and seeing his brothers as similarly belittled. Since he can find himself only in them, he has cut himself off from salvation. Remember that the Holy Spirit interprets the body only as a means of communication. Being that communication link between God and his separated sons, the Holy Spirit interprets everything you have made in the light of what he is. The ego separates through the body. The Holy Spirit reaches through it to others. You do not perceive your brothers as the Holy Spirit does because you do not interpret their bodies and yours solely as a means of joining their minds and uniting them with yours and mine. This interpretation of the body will change your mind entirely about its value. Of itself it has none. If you use the body for attack, it is harmful to you. If you use it only to reach the minds of those who believe they are bodies, and teach them through the body that this is not so, you will begin to understand the power of the mind that is in both of you. If you use the body for this and only for this, you cannot use it for attack. In the service of uniting, it becomes a beautiful lesson in communion, which has value until communion is. This is God's way of making unlimited what you have limited. The Holy Spirit does not see the body as you do because he knows the only reality anything can have is the service it can render God on behalf of the function he has given it. Communication ends separation. Attack promotes it. The body is beautiful or ugly, holy or savage, helpful or harmful, according to the use to which it is put. And in the body of another you will see the use to which you have put yours. If the body becomes fewer means which you give to the Holy Spirit to use on behalf of union of the sonship, you will not see anything physical except as what it is. Use it for truth, and you will see it truly. Misuse it, and you will misunderstand it because you have already done so by misusing it. Interpret anything apart from the Holy Spirit, and you will mistrust it. This will lead you to hatred and attack and loss of peace. Yet all loss comes only from your own misunderstanding. Loss of any kind is impossible. When you look upon a brother as a physical entity, his power and glory are lost to you, and so are yours. You have attacked him, but you must have attacked yourself first. Do not see him this way for your own salvation, which must bring him his. Do not allow him to belittle himself in your mind, but give him freedom from his belief in littleness and thus escape from yours. As part of you, he is holy. As part of me, you are. To communicate with part of God himself is to reach beyond the kingdom to its creator, through his voice which he has established as part of you. Rejoice, then, that of yourselves you can do nothing. You are not of yourselves. He of whom you are has willed your power and glory for you with which you can perfectly accomplish his holy will for you, when you so will it yourself. He has not withdrawn his gifts from you, but you have withdrawn them from him. Let no son of God remain hidden for his name's sake, because his name is yours. Remember that the Bible says, the word or thought was made flesh. Strictly speaking this is impossible, since it seems to involve the translation of one order of reality into another. Different orders of reality merely appear to exist, just as different orders of miracles do. Thought cannot be made into flesh except by belief, since thought is not physical. Yet thought is communication, for which the body can be used. This is the only natural use to which it can be put. To use the body unnaturally is to lose sight of the Holy Spirit's purpose, and thus to confuse the goal of his curriculum. There is nothing so frustrating to a learner as to be placed in a curriculum which he cannot learn. His sense of adequacy suffers, and he must become depressed. Being faced with an impossible learning situation, regardless of why it is impossible, is the most depressing thing in the world. In fact, 
it is ultimately why the world is depressing. The Holy Spirit's curriculum is never depressing because it is a curriculum of joy. Whenever the reaction to learning is depression, it is only because the goal of the curriculum has been lost sight of. In the world, not even the body is perceived as whole. Its purpose is seen as fragmented into many functions which bear little or no relationship to each other, so that it appears to be ruled by chaos. Guided by the ego, it is. Guided by the Holy Spirit, it is not. It becomes only a means by which the part of the mind you have separated from your soul can reach beyond its distortions, and return to the soul. The ego's temple thus becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, where devotion to him replaces devotion to the ego. In this sense the body does become a temple to God, because his voice abides in it by directing the use to which it is put. Healing is the result of using the body solely for communication. Since this is natural, it heals by making whole, which is also natural. All mind is whole, and the belief that part of it is physical, or not mind, is a fragmented or sick interpretation. Mind cannot be made physical, but it can be made manifest through the physical if it uses the body to go beyond itself. By reaching out, the mind extends itself. It does not stop at the body, for if it does, it is blocked in its purpose. A mind which has been blocked has allowed itself to be vulnerable to attack because it has turned against itself. The removal of the blocks, then, is the only way to guarantee help and healing. Help and healing are the normal expressions of a mind which is working through the body, but not in it. If the mind believes the body is its goal, it will distort its perception of the body, and by blocking its own extension beyond it, will induce illness by fostering separation. Perceiving the body as a separate entity cannot but foster illness, because it is not true. A medium of communication will lose its usefulness if it is used for anything else. To use a medium of communication as a medium of attack is an obvious confusion in purpose. To communicate is to join, and to attack is to separate. How can you do both simultaneously with the same thing? and not suffer. Perception of the body can be unified only by one purpose. This releases the mind from the temptation to see the body in many lights, and gives it over entirely to the one light in which it can be really understood at all. To confuse a learning device with a curriculum goal is a fundamental confusion. Learning can hardly be arrested at its own aids with hope of understanding either the aids or the learning's real purpose. Learning must lead beyond the body to the re-establishment of the power of the mind in it. This can be accomplished only if the mind extends to other minds, and does not arrest itself in its extension. The arrest of the mind's extension is the cause of all illness because only extension is the mind's function. The opposite of joy is depression. When your learning promotes depression instead of joy, you cannot be listening to God's joyous teacher and you must be learning amiss. To see your body as anything except a means of pure extension is to limit your mind and hurt yourself. Health is therefore nothing more than united purpose. If the body is brought under the purpose of the mind, the body becomes whole because the mind's purpose is one. Attack can only be an assumed purpose of the body, because apart from the mind the body has no purpose at all. You are not limited by the body, and, thought cannot be made flesh. Yet mind can be manifested through the body if it goes beyond it and does not interpret it as limitation. Whenever you see another as limited to or by the body, you are imposing this limit on yourself. Are you willing to accept this, when your whole purpose for learning should be to escape from limitations? To conceive of the body as a means of attack of any kind and to entertain even the possibility that joy could possibly result is a clear-cut indication of a poor learner. He has accepted a learning goal in obvious contradiction to the unified purpose of the curriculum, and is interfering with his ability to accept its purpose as his own. Joy is unified purpose, and unified purpose is only God's. When yours is unified, it is his. Interfere with his purpose, and you need salvation. You have condemned yourself but condemnation is not of God. Therefore, it is not true. 
no more are any of the results of your condemnation. When you see a brother as a body, you are condemning him because you have condemned yourself. Yet if all condemnation is unreal, and it must be unreal since it is a form of attack, then it can have no results. Do not allow yourselves to suffer from the results of what is not true. Free your minds from the belief that this is possible. In its complete impossibility, and your full awareness of its complete impossibility, lie your only hope for release. But what other hope would you want? Freedom from illusions lies only in not believing them. There is no attack, but there is unlimited communication, and therefore unlimited power and wholeness. The power of wholeness is extension. Do not arrest your thought in this world, and you will open your mind to creation in God. The body as means or end. Attitudes toward the body are attitudes toward attack. The ego's definitions of everything are childish, and always based on what it believes a thing is for. This is because it is incapable of true generalizations, and equates what it sees with the function it ascribes to it. It does not equate it with what it is. To the ego, the body is to attack with. Equating you with the body, it teaches that you are to attack with because this is what it believes. The body, then, is not the source of its own health. The body's condition lies solely in your interpretation of its function. The reason why definitions in terms of function are inferior is that they may well be inaccurate. Functions are part of being since they arise from it, but the relationship is not reciprocal. The whole does define the part, but the part does not define the whole. This is as true of knowledge as it is of perception. The reason to know in part is to know entirely is because of the fundamental difference between knowledge and perception. In perception the whole is built up of parts, which can separate and reassemble in different constellations. Knowledge never changes, so its constellation is permanent. The only areas in which part whole relationships have any meaning are those in which change is possible. There is no difference between the whole and the part where change is impossible. The body exists in a world which seems to contain two voices which are fighting for its possession. In this perceived constellation, the body is regarded as capable of shifting its control from one to the other making the concept of both health and sickness possible. The ego makes a fundamental confusion between means and ends as it always does. Regarding the body as an end, the ego has no real use for it because it is not an end. You must have noticed an outstanding characteristic of every end that the ego has accepted as its own. When you have achieved it, it has not satisfied you. This is why the ego is forced to shift from one end to another without ceasing, so that you will continue to hope that it can yet offer you something. It has been particularly difficult to overcome the ego's belief in the body as an end because this is synonymous with the belief in attack as an end. The ego has a real investment in sickness. If you are sick, how can you object to the ego's firm belief that you are not invulnerable? This is a particularly appealing argument from the ego's point of view because it obscures the obvious attack which underlies the sickness. If you accepted this and also decided against attack, you could not give this false witness to the ego's stand. It is hard to perceive sickness as a false witness, because you do not realize that it is entirely out of keeping with what you want. This witness, then, appears to be innocent and trustworthy because you have not seriously cross-examined him. If you did, you would not consider sickness such a strong witness on behalf of the ego's views. A more honest statement would be as follows, those who want the ego are predisposed to defend it. Therefore, their choice of witnesses should be suspect from the beginning. The ego does not call upon witnesses who would disagree with its case nor does the Holy Spirit. We have said that judgment is the function of the Holy Spirit, and one which he is perfectly equipped to fulfill. The ego, as a judge, gives anything but an impartial judgment. When the ego calls on a witness, it has already made the witness an ally. It is still true that the body has no function of itself because it is not an end. The ego, 
however, establishes it as an end because, as such, it will lose its true function. This is the purpose of everything the ego does. Its sole aim is to lose sight of the function of everything. A sick body does not make any sense. It could not make sense because sickness is not what the body is for. Sickness is meaningful only if the two basic premises on which the ego's interpretation of the body rests are true. Specifically, these are that the body is for attack, and that you are a body. Without these premises, sickness is completely inconceivable. Sickness is a way of demonstrating that you can be hurt. It is a witness to your frailty, your vulnerability, and your extreme need to depend on external guidance. The ego uses this as its best argument for your need for its guidance. It dictates endless prescriptions for avoiding catastrophic outcomes. The Holy Spirit, perfectly aware of the same data, does not bother to analyze them at all. If the data are meaningless there is no point in considering them. The function of truth is to collect data which are true. There is no point in trying to make sense out of meaningless data. Any way you handle them results in nothing. The more complicated the results become, the harder it may be to recognize their nothingness, but it is not necessary to examine all possible outcomes to which premises give rise to judge them truly. A learning device is not a teacher. It cannot tell you how you feel. You do not know how you feel because you have accepted the ego's confusion, and you think that a learning device can tell you how you feel. Sickness is merely another example of your insistence on asking the guidance of a teacher who does not know the answer. The ego is incapable of knowing how you feel. When we said that the ego does not know anything, we said the one thing about the ego that is wholly true. But there is a corollary, if knowledge is being and the ego has no knowledge, then the ego has no being. You might well ask how the voice of something which does not exist can be so insistent. Have you seriously considered the distorting power of something you want, even if it is not true? You have had many instances of how what you want can distort what you see and hear. No one can doubt the ego's skill in building up false cases. Nor can anyone doubt your willingness to listen until you will not to tolerate anything except truth. When you lay the ego aside, it will be gone. The Holy Spirit's voice is as loud as your willingness to listen. It cannot be louder without violating your will, which the Holy Spirit seeks to free, but never to command. The Holy Spirit teaches you to use your body only to reach your brothers, so he can teach his message through you. This will heal them and therefore heal you. Everything used in accordance with its function as the Holy Spirit sees it cannot be sick. Everything used otherwise is. Do not allow the body to be a mirror of a split mind. Do not let it be an image of your own perception of littleness. Do not let it reflect your will to attack. Health is the natural state of anything whose interpretation is left to the Holy Spirit, who perceives no attack on anything. Health is the result of relinquishing all attempts to use the body lovelessly. Health is the beginning of the proper perspective on life under the guidance of the one teacher who knows what life is, being the voice for life itself. Healing as corrected perception. We once said that the Holy Spirit is the answer. He is the answer to everything, because he knows what the answer to everything is. The ego does not know what a real question is, although it asks an endless number. Yet you can learn this as you learn to question the value of the ego, and thus establish your ability to evaluate its questions. When the ego tempts you to sickness, do not ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body, for this would merely be to accept the ego's belief that the body is the proper aim for healing. Ask, rather, that the Holy Spirit teach you the right perception of the body, for perception alone can be distorted. Only perception can be sick, because only perception can be wrong. Wrong perception is distorted willing, which wants things to be as they are not. The reality of everything is totally harmless, because total harmlessness is the condition of its reality. It is also the condition of your awareness of its reality. You do not have to seek reality. 
it will seek you and find you, when you meet its conditions. Its conditions are part of what it is. And this part only is up to you. The rest is of itself. You need do so little, because it is so powerful that your little part will bring the whole to you. Accept, then, your little part, and let the whole be yours. Wholeness heals because it is of the mind. All forms of sickness, even unto death, are physical expressions of the fear of awakening. They are attempts to reinforce unconsciousness out of fear of consciousness. This is a pathetic way of trying not to know by rendering the faculties from knowing ineffectual. Rest in peace is a blessing for the living, not the dead, because rest comes from waking, not from sleeping. Sleep is withdrawing, waking is joining. Dreams are illusions of joining, taking on the ego's distortions about what joining means if you are sleeping under its guidance. Yet the Holy Spirit, too, has use for sleep, and can use dreams on behalf of waking, if you will let him. How you wake is the sign of how you have used sleep. To whom did you give it? Under which teacher did you place it? Whenever you wake dispiritedly, it was not of the Holy Spirit. Only when you awake and joyously have you utilized sleep according to the Holy Spirit's purpose. You can indeed be drugged by sleep, but this is always because you have misused it on behalf of sickness. Sleep is no more a form of death than death is a form of unconsciousness. Unconsciousness is impossible. You can rest in peace only because you are awake. Healing is release from the fear of waking and the substitution of the will to wake. The will to wake is the will to love, since all healing involves replacing fear with love. The Holy Spirit cannot distinguish among degrees of error, for if he taught that one form of sickness is more serious than another, he would be teaching that one error can be more real than another. His function is to distinguish only between the false and the true, replacing the false with the true. The ego, which always weakens the will wants to separate the body from the mind. This is an attempt to destroy it, yet the ego actually believes that it is protecting it. This is because the ego believes that mind is dangerous, and that to make mindless is to heal. But to make mindless is impossible, since it would mean to make nothing out of what God created. The ego despises weakness, even though it makes every effort to induce it. The ego wants only what it hates. To the ego this is perfectly sensible. Believing in the power of attack, the ego wants attack. You have surely begun to realize that this is a very practical course, which means exactly what it says. So does the Bible, if it is properly understood. There has been a marked tendency on the part of many of the Bible's followers, and also its translators, to be entirely literal about fear and its effects, but not about love and its results. Thus, hellfire means burning, but raising the dead becomes allegorical. Actually, it is particularly the references to the outcomes of love which should be taken literally because the Bible is about love, being about God. The Bible enjoins you to be perfect, to heal all errors, to take no thought of the body as separate, and to accomplish all things in my name. This is not my name alone, for ours is a shared identification. The name of God's Son is one, and you are enjoined to do the works of love because we share this oneness. Our minds are whole because they are one. If you are sick you are withdrawing from me. Yet you cannot withdraw from me alone. You can only withdraw from yourself and me. I would not ask you to do the things you cannot do, and it is impossible that I could do things you cannot do. Given this, and given this quite literally, there can be nothing which prevents you from doing exactly what I ask, and everything which argues for your doing it. I give you no limits because God lays none upon you. When you limit yourself we are not of one mind, and that is sickness. Yet sickness is not of the body, but of the mind. All forms of dysfunction are merely signs that the mind has split, and does not accept a unified purpose. The unification of purpose then, is the Holy Spirit's only way of healing. This is because it is the only level at which healing means anything. 
the re-establishing of meaning in a chaotic thought system is the only way to heal it. We have said that your task is only to meet the conditions for meaning, since meaning itself is of God. Yet your return to meaning is essential to His because your meaning is part of His. Your healing, then, is part of His health since it is part of His wholeness. He cannot lose this, but you cannot know it. Yet it is still His will for you, and His will must stand forever and in all things. The Acceptance of Reality Fear of the will of God is one of the strangest beliefs that the human mind has ever made. This could not possibly have occurred unless the mind were already profoundly split, making it possible for the mind to be afraid of what it really is. It is apparent that reality cannot threaten anything except illusions, since reality can only uphold truth. The very fact that the will of God, which is what you are, is perceived as fearful to you demonstrates that you are afraid of what you are. It is not, then, the will of God of which you are afraid, but yours. Your will is not the ego's, and that is why the ego is against you. What seems to be the fear of God is really only the fear of your own reality. It is impossible to learn anything consistently in a state of panic. If the purpose of this course is to help you learn what you are, and if you have already decided that what you are is fearful, then it must follow that you will not learn this course. Yet you might remember that the reason for the course is that you do not know who you are. If you do not know your reality, how would you know whether it is fearful or not? The association of truth and fear, which would be highly artificial at most, is particularly inappropriate in the minds of those who do not know what truth is. All that this kind of association means is that you are arbitrarily endowing something quite beyond your awareness with something you do not want. It is evident, then, that you are judging something of which you are totally unaware. You have set this strange situation up so that it is completely impossible to escape from it without a guide who does know what your reality is. The purpose of this guide is merely to remind you of what you want. He is not attempting to force an alien will upon you. He is merely making every possible effort, within the limits you impose on him, to re-establish your own will in your consciousness. You have imprisoned your will in your unconscious, where it remains available but cannot help you. When we said that the Holy Spirit's function is to sort out the true from the false in your unconscious, we meant that he has the power to look into what you have hidden and perceive the will of God there. His perception of this will can make it real to you because he is in your mind, and therefore he is your reality. If, then, his perception of your mind brings its reality to you, he is teaching you what you are. The only source of fear in this whole process can only be what you think you lose. Yet it is only what the Holy Spirit sees that you can possibly have. We have emphasized many times that the Holy Spirit will never call upon you to sacrifice anything. But if you ask the sacrifice of reality of yourself, the Holy Spirit must remind you that this is not God's will because it is not yours. There is no difference between your will and God's. If you did not have split minds, you would recognize that willing is salvation because it is communication. It is impossible to communicate in alien tongues. You and your Creator can communicate through creation because that, and only that, is your joint will. Divided wills do not communicate because they speak for different things to the same mind. This loses the ability to communicate simply because confused communication does not mean anything. A message cannot be said to be communicated unless it makes sense. How sensible can your messages be when you ask for what you do not want? Yet as long as you are afraid of your will, this is precisely what you will ask for. You may insist that the Holy Spirit does not answer you, but it might be wiser to consider the kind of asker you are. You do not ask only for what you want. This is solely because you are afraid you might receive it, and you would. That is really why you persist in asking the teacher who could not possibly teach you your will. Of him you can never learn it and this gives you the illusion of safety. Yet you cannot be safe from truth, but only in it. Reality is the only safety. Your will is your salvation because it is the same as God's.
The separation is nothing more than the belief that it is different. No mind can believe that its will is stronger than God's. If, then, a mind believes that its will is different from his, it can only decide either that there is no God or that God's will is fearful. The former accounts for the atheist and the latter for the martyr. Martyrdom takes many forms, the category including all doctrines which holds that God demands sacrifices of any kind. Either basic type of insane decision will induce panic because the atheist believes he is alone, and the martyr believes that God is crucifying him. Both really fear abandonment and retaliation, but the atheist is more reactive against abandonment, and the martyr against retaliation. The atheist maintains that God has left him, but he does not care. He will, however, become very fearful, and hence very angry, if anyone suggests that God has not left him. The martyr, on the other hand, is more aware of guilt, and believing that punishment is inevitable, attempts to teach himself to like it. The truth is, very simply, that no one wants either abandonment or retaliation. Many people seek both, but it is still true that they do not want them. Can you ask the Holy Spirit for gifts such as these, and actually expect to receive them? He cannot make you want something you do not want. When you ask the universal giver for what you do not want, you are asking for what cannot be given because it was never created. It was never created because it was never your will for you. Ultimately everyone must remember the will of God because ultimately everyone must recognize himself. This recognition is the recognition that his will and God's are one. In the presence of truth there are no unbelievers and no sacrifices. In the security of reality, fear is totally meaningless. To deny what is can only seem to be fearful. Fear cannot be real without a cause, and God is the only cause. God is love, and you do want him. This is your will. Ask for this and you will be answered because you will be asking only for what belongs to you. When you ask the Holy Spirit for what would hurt you, he cannot answer because nothing can hurt you, and so you are asking for nothing. Any desire which stems from the ego is a desire for nothing, and to ask for it is not a request. It is merely a denial in the form of a request. The Holy Spirit is not concerned with form at all being aware only of meaning. The ego cannot ask the Holy Spirit for anything because there is complete communication failure between them. Yet you can ask for everything of the Holy Spirit because your requests are real, being of your will. Would the Holy Spirit deny the will of God? And could he fail to recognize it in his sons? The energy which you withdraw from creation you expend on fear. This is not because your energy is limited but because you have limited it. You do not recognize the enormous waste of energy which you expend in denying truth. What would you say of someone who persisted in attempting the impossible, believing that to achieve it is success? The belief that you must have the impossible in order to be happy is totally at variance with the principle of creation. God could not will that happiness depended on what you could never have. The fact that God is love does not require belief but it does require acceptance. It is indeed possible for you to deny facts, although it is impossible for you to change them. If you hold your hands over your eyes, you will not see because you are interfering with the laws of seeing. If you deny love, you will not know it because your cooperation is the law of its being. You cannot change laws you did not make, and the laws of happiness were created for you, not by you. Attempts of any kind to deny what is are fearful, and if they are strong, they will induce panic. Willing against reality, though impossible, can be made into a very persistent goal even though you do not want it. But consider the result of this strange decision. You are devoting your mind to what you do not want. How real can this devotion be? If you do not want it, it was never created. If it was never created, it is nothing. Can you really devote yourself to nothing? God in his devotion to you created you devoted to everything, and gave you what you are devoted to. Otherwise, you would not have been created perfect. Reality is everything, 
and therefore you have everything because you are real. You cannot make the unreal because the absence of reality is fearful, and fear cannot be created. As long as you believe that fear is possible, you will not create. Opposing orders of reality make reality meaningless, and reality is meaning. Remember, then, that God's will is already possible, and nothing else will ever be. This is the simple acceptance of reality because only this is real. You cannot distort reality and know what it is. And if you do distort reality, you will experience anxiety, depression and ultimately panic because you are trying to make yourself unreal. When you feel these things, do not try to look beyond yourself for truth, for truth can only be within you. Say, therefore, Christ is in me and where he is God must be. For Christ is part of him. The answer to prayer. Everyone who has ever tried to use prayer to request something has experienced what appears to be failure. This is not only true in connection with specific things which might be harmful, but also in connection with requests which are strictly in line with this course. The latter, in particular, might be incorrectly interpreted as proof that the course does not mean what it says. You must remember, however, that the course does state, and repeatedly, that its purpose is the escape from fear. Let us suppose, then, that what you request of the Holy Spirit is what you really want, but you are still afraid of it. Should this be the case, your attainment of it would no longer be what you want, even if it is. This accounts for why certain specific forms of healing are not achieved, even though the state of healing is. It frequently happens that an individual asks for physical healing because he is fearful of bodily harm. At the same time, however, if he were healed physically, the threat to his thought system would be considerably more fearful to him than its physical expression. In this case he is not really asking for release from fear, but for the removal of a symptom which he has selected. This request is, therefore, not for healing at all. The Bible emphasizes that all prayers are answered, and this must be true if no effort is wasted. The very fact that one has asked the Holy Spirit for anything will ensure a response. Yet it is equally certain that no response given by the Holy Spirit will ever be one which would increase fear. It is possible that his answer will not be heard at all. It is impossible, however, that it will be lost. There are many answers which you have already received but have not yet heard. I assure you that they are waiting for you. It is indeed truth that no effort is wasted. If you would know your prayers are answered, never doubt a son of God. Do not question him and do not confound him, for your faith in him is your faith in yourself. If you would know God and his answer, believe in me whose faith in you cannot be shaken. Can you ask of the Holy Spirit truly, and doubt your brother? Believe his words are true because of the truth which is in him. You will unite with the truth in him, and his words will be true. As you hear him you will hear me. Listening to truth is the only way you can hear it now and finally know it. The message your brother gives you is up to you. What does he say to you? What would you have him say? Your decision about him determines the message you receive. Remember that the Holy Spirit is in him and his voice speaks to you through him. What can so holy a brother tell you except truth? But are you listening to it? Your brother may not know who he is, but there is a light in his mind which does know. This light can shine into yours, making his words true and making you able to hear them. His words are the Holy Spirit's answer to you. Is your faith in him strong enough to let you hear? Salvation is of your brother. The Holy Spirit extends from your mind to his, and answers you. You cannot hear the voice for God in yourself alone because you are not alone. And his answer is only for what you are. You will not know the trust I have in you unless you extend it. You will not trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit, or believe that it is for you unless you hear it in others. It must be for your brother because it is for you. Would God have created a voice for you alone? Could you hear his answer except as he answers all of God's sons? Hear of your brother what you would have me hear of you, 
for you would not want me to be deceived. I love you for the truth in you, as God does. Your deceptions may deceive you, but they cannot deceive me. Knowing what you are, I cannot doubt you. I hear only the Holy Spirit in you, who speaks to me through you. If you would hear me, hear my brothers in whom God's voice speaks. The answer to all prayers lies in them. You will be answered as you hear the answer in everyone. Do not listen to anything else or you will not hear truth. Believe in your brothers because I believe in you, and you will learn that my belief in you is justified. Believe in me by believing in them, for the sake of what God gave them. They will answer you, if you learn to ask truth of them. Do not ask for blessings without blessing them, for only in this way can you learn how blessed you are. By following this way, you are looking for the truth in you. This is not going beyond yourself but toward yourself. Hear only God's answer in his sons, and you are answered. To disbelieve is to side against, or to attack. To believe is to accept, and to side with. To believe is not to be credulous, but to accept and appreciate. What you do not believe you do not appreciate, and you cannot be grateful for what you do not value. There is a price you will pay for judgment because judgment is the setting of a price. And as you set it you will pay it. If paying is equated with getting, you will set the price low but demand a high return. You will have forgotten, however, that your return is in proportion to your judgment of worth. If paying is associated with giving, it cannot be perceived as loss, and the reciprocal relationship of giving and receiving will be recognized. The price will then be set high because of the value of the return. Their price for getting is to lose sight of value, making it inevitable that you will not value what you receive. Valuing it little, you will not appreciate it and will not want it. Never forget, then, that you have set the value on what you receive, and have priced it by what you give. To believe that it is possible to get much for little is to believe that you can bargain with God. God's laws are always fair and perfectly consistent. By giving you receive. But to receive is to accept, not to get. It is impossible not to have, but it is possible not to know you have. The recognition of having is the willingness for giving, and only by this willingness can you recognize what you have. What you give is therefore the value you put on what you have, being the exact measure of the value you put upon it. And this, in turn, is the measure of how much you want it. You can ask of the Holy Spirit, then, only by giving to Him, and you can give to Him only where you see Him. If you see Him in everyone, consider how much you will be asking of Him, and how much you will receive. He will deny you nothing because you have denied Him nothing, and so you can share everything. This is the way, and the only way, to have His answer because His answer is all you can ask for and want. Say, then, to everyone. Because I will to know myself, I see you as gods. Son and my brother.